yeah, thanks a lot of, for having me at this conference, at this great place. And all I'm going to talk today is joint work with Michele Fournier. And I will talk about the algebraicity of polyquadratic p adiplectic points. But I, but I omitted the p adic because there were already enough p's on the board. Um, OK, so what's the motivation for all of this? So I start with A, an elliptic curve. A curve over some uh, number field F. So as you all know, uh, the group of F valued points of A is well a finite, finitely generated abelian group, so it's isomorphic to some power of F, a uh, power of Z. Uh, times something finite, and well, this will be the rank of A over F. And the main question is, uh, 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 how to generate uh, elements in the R's are A over F, exterior product of A over F. And maybe tensored with Q. So this will be a one-dimensional Q vector space. So of course, an interesting question is how to generate a non-zero element in there. But first of all, how do we generate just any element in there? Maybe zero. So that's like the leading question. And so I mean, the only known systematic supply of elements or points on elliptic curves are Hickner points, so let me just recall this briefly. So if f is totally real, and E over f is a quadratic CM extension, and we have to assume that A is modular, and we have to assume some kind of Hegner hypothesis. Um, so this is related to the splitting behavior of the primes where A has bad reduction in the extension E over F. And I never write down these Hegner hypotheses in my talk. In, in that case, one can construct a Hegner point, point P in the e-valued points of A, maybe, OK. I, I don't care about torsion, so I always tend to with Q. And um, so one has a theorem. And I guess there are a lot of people I should mention here, Gorsagi, Kolivagin, uh, Zhang, Nekova, at least. So if, if this point is non-zero, or non-torsion equivalently, then this rank of A is equal to 1. Um, equal to 1, right. And so, I mean, this P will be a generator of of A of E, and it's over Q. So, and maybe a small reminder on the construction of, of P. So, so, actually, we will have some kind of uh, Shimura curve. And okay, then we have the other Jacobi map. It's Jacobian, and modul modularity tells us that 
our elliptic curve A is just the quotient of this Jacobian. And then we have here a small x, which is a CM point on this uh, on the Shimura curve. And now I'm lying a little bit. I'd say this CM point is mapped to our point P. But actually, this is not <coughs> exactly true. Maybe you have to take some sum of CM points. But for this motivation, I think this is, this is enough. And so here we have this Shimura curve, so a one-dimensional Shimura variety. And then there is this hope. Uh, I, I write hope, but there's actually, uh, I mean, they're actually conjectures, but I don't make them precise, so I just call this hope by Nekova and Scholl. Scholl. And um, this tells you that you should produce, um, one should be able to produce points and such exterior products of A of E um, via CM points on R dimensional uh, quaternionic Hilbert modular varieties. I mean, this is a very unprecise statement, but somehow one should be able to start with the endpoints on this higher dimensional Shimura varieties and somehow cook out elements uh, in this exterior product of uh, rational points on the elliptic curve. OK, generalizing the classical construction of Hegner points. So my joint work with Michele, uh, so let's just say these conjectures of Nekova Scholl um, are pretty geometric. They say somehow that one should be able to, I mean, one has somehow a, a Galois action on all of these objects, and one should be able to extend this to an action of a so-called plectic um, Galois group and maybe have some kind of vari plectic varieties, whatever they are. And in, in our joint work, we somehow ignore this and somehow try to do something very uh, on hand. And uh, somehow one has explicit formulas for, for these kind of things. And we just look at these explicit formulas and try to generalize them um, to a, a higher dimensional setting. So um, and these are the plectic star Kegner points. And so, what is our setup? So, so these points should be sent to F, right? So, like your assumption. No, not necessarily. Oh, okay. yeah. um, I mean, you can just take some of the trace down to, to, right. to F, and either this will be, I mean, if you already know that this is non zero, I mean, either it will be zero or non zero, and this just tells you somehow, uh, I mean, you have Frobenius acting on. Or, I mean, you have the Galois group acting on A of E, and it depends on, well, whether the plus or minus part is non-zero. But maybe this will pop up later again. Um, so we actually start with um, um, so an arbitrary number field. So most of the construction goes through for an arbitrary number field, which doesn't have to be totally real, because as I said, we don't use geometry. Um, but I mean, some of it, what I'm going to say would be wrong if f is not totally real. So I just uh, assume this for simplicity. Um, and e over f will be just any quadratic extension, so no CM assumption. Um, but we, um, so a over f still modular. 
But as I said, this will be a periodic construction, so I replace the um, CM assumption by some assumption at, at P. And there will always be S, like a finite set of primes, uh, primes of F lying above P, such that. Um, Some of the analog of the CM condition is that all these PI are inert in E over F. And there is a, uh, I mean, there's a second hidden condition when you think about uh, Archimedean primes. Is the same P as there? Uh, well, let's just say for all P and S. No. Some characters, some oh, sorry, yeah. Um, some set of primes of F lying above P, such that. Um, so they are all inert in E over F. And. Da, 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 da. And so if you look uh, at the Archimedean places, you know that there's always a, a complex uniformization of your elliptic curves by C modulus some lattice. Uh, something similar is not true in the periodic case, so we have to assume this, and the right assumption here is that A has multiplicative reduction for all uh, or at all P and S. So uh, this is the same as having an um, uh, analytic uniformization. And again, some, some kind of Hegner hypothesis uh, that I'm not going to talk about. That also sort of answers the question if these are all the primes above P. I mean, basically, you, you consider all primes uh, above P and F such that they are inert and has A has multiplicative reduction at all P and S. OK. So under these conditions, we construct uh, the splectic stark Hegner points. And what, what is this point? So this is a strange beast. So we get the plectic star Hegner point. So called PS. And this will be an element in, so you take uh, the local uh, points of our elliptic curves at all, well, at E P1 until EPR, and you take a completed tensor product. Or in other ways, you could also say the tensor product over Z hat. So these are, um, yeah, these are profinite groups. Moreover, they're basically pro uh, ZP modules times something finite. And maybe in the end, there will be also some denominators that tensor this with Q. So this will be the plectic star Kickner point. So this is a very strange object. We're taking ten completed tensor products of local points. But that's what it is. And um, I'm not going to give you the construction of this point. It would take probably the whole lecture. And after that, you wouldn't be any wiser. So i rather give you. Uh, some motivation why you should look at the construction by yourself afterwards. So um, let's first start with some remarks. So, so the individual objects are profinite? I mean, these are all profinite, yeah. I mean, they're basically pro P times something finite. Um, 
Okay, so the first remark is that uh, uh, this is a periodic transcendental, transcendental construction. So for example, involves some periodic integrals. Over some measures which are somehow um, um, elliptic analogs of these measures Mahesh talked about, but I'm not going to uh, define them. So maybe that's the first remark, but so uh, if E over F is CM, uh, somehow the input to this. Um, Input uh, comes from CM points on Hilbert modular varieties. So um, here we have some kind of uh, periodic integrals over some kind of measures, but the functions we are integrating over is something like a tensor product of functions. Uh, of rational functions that have divisors supported on CM points. So there is some kind of relation to, to geometry, but it doesn't help somehow. And the, the last case, maybe, if E over F is CM and the size of S is equal to 1, then this PS, so in this case, S is just given by some kind of prime p. So this is called this pp. This is just equal to the usual Higner point. And this is quaternionic, always quaternionic, yeah. Yeah, so quaternionic. Um, and so actually, I explained this the wrong way around. This is where the whole story started. And this was in an article by Bertolini and Damon from the late 90s. Uh, I mean, they considered the case f equal to q, for example, uh, was later generalized by essentially Mock to, to arbitrary totally real number fields. So actually, what they do is they start with this point uh, p. And so in this case, it, I mean, under all this Higner hypothesis and so on, this Shimura curve that appears has a periodic uniformization. And then uh, you have also a periodic description of the Abel Jacobi map, uh, essentially due to Manin and Greenfeld. And well, then you can write down this, uh, this classical Higner point with some kind of periodic integrals. And this is this point PP. And what we are doing is essentially start with this explicit formula and then extending it to, to the case of multiple primes in our set S. OK. OK, now we have this plectic star Kegner point uh, in our strange tensor product. And I want to say somehow what I want to talk about algebraicity. So I want to re relate this space to some algebraic space, and that's going to be the determinant map. And I guess you have uh, guessed my nationality by now. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, so what about algebraicity? Well, I call this set okay, R. So we have a determinant map from the R's exterior power of uh, AE to the tensor product uh, P and S A P. By doing the following, well, I mean, we have an, for every P and S, we have this inclusion of A of E into A of E P. And so what we're doing here is we map a wedge product to the determinant of this matrix where we take yota p1 x1, yota p2 of x1, and so on, till yota pr x1. And here we take uh, yota p1 of x2, and so on, until yota p1 of xr. So we take the determinant of this big matrix. Um, so just to make this more uh, feasible, so if r is equal to 2, what we're doing is we send x1 wedge xr to uh, yeah. x1 x2. Ah, x1 x2. I mean, r is equal to 2, it would be. <laughs> um, send this to yota p1 of x1. So this is an element of a e p1 uh, tensor yota p2 of x2 minus yota p1 of x2 tensor yota p1 uh, p2 of x1. I mean, this makes it maybe more feasible what this determinant is. Okay, great. And then uh, let's write down the conjecture at some point. Um, here. And again, I mean, it's always, I, I will forget to write this down, but in the end, we just care about uh, non torsion phenomena. So maybe I consider this dead as a map of QP vector spaces. Conjecture. Two conjectures. So the first is if R is greater or equal than uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if the of the rank of A over E, then then this plectic star Kegner point is in the image of the determinant map. So it's an algebraic point, in a sense. And um, if in addition, so if R is bigger than, uh, so the size of our set S is greater or equal than the rank, and if in addition, uh, this point is non-zero, then we actually have an equality. Okay. 
So these are the conjectures, but of course you can conjecture a lot of things. So uh, what's the evidence for this conjecture? Of course, we have the evidence for uh, if s, the size of s is equal to one, then this follows from like the classical theory of Higner points, but that's not the interesting case for us. Um, I mean, w we haven't checked torsion phenomenons yet, so just to be on the safe side, this is what we conjecture. I should say that if, no, I shouldn't lie. Um, I guess when E over F is CM, there shouldn't be any denominators. Um, in the other situations, it, I mean, I don't go into the construction, but there is some choice of, um, I mean, we first construct an L most of the construction works integrally, but then we, I mean, there's some kind of lifting from one, um, um, one cohomology group to, the, to another, and, but one has some kind of finite co-kernel, and maybe this co-kernel is zero, we don't know, and so maybe it's defined integrally, maybe not. So. But I guess if E over F is CM, it should be defined integrally. There shouldn't be any. Yeah, there's no interesting higher cohomology going on there. But yeah. Um, Yeah, there's the problem that if you do the base change, for example, if you do a base change such that the rank uh, stays the same, this is a bad idea because then this determinant map will be just zero. No, in that case. But maybe you, can, uh, maybe you can increase the rank, and we will see this phenomenon, but, and then the determinant map isn't zero anymore. Maybe there's a clever way to do that, but we don't know. General. Sorry? You can't choose a random field to base it into because you've got, you've got multiplicative reduction. Right? Yeah, but, but I mean, multiplicative reduction stays multiplicative reduction, right? You can just base it. And, but the question is, do you take like, I mean, you change your set S as well if you take a base change. You make, make it larger and then, but we will see this in, I hope, the end of the talk, that you can do tricks like that. Okay, so what's the evidence? So first of all, if S just consists of a single element, I already said this is a classical theory of Higner points. So then there is a numerical evidence mm, by um, Fonea Gita and Masteo. They work in the situation where uh, F is totally real. Uh, sorry, F is real quadratic. Uh, and of course, we want, they want some uh, uh, interesting construction to the prime, prime P is split. 
so that you have two primes in F, and um, E over F is so-called almost totally real extension, meaning uh, E has one complex and two real <coughs> places. And this is also a situation, I mean, you don't expect any classical Hegner points or so flowing around. So this is a real uh, situation where you don't know how to produce points, but they somehow can check in examples where a computer algebra system can generate like the model value group. Um, they can check somehow numerically these conjectures, but not um, um, I mean, they check this, num this uh, for the conjecture for uh, what I would call uh, the minus projection of PS. And so what is the minus projection? Uh, yeah, this is on the board, great. I mean, in the S equal to one case, it's it's really integral. There's Most nothing. It, yeah. Well, maybe I don't know, like it was implicit, but in the S equal one case and not CM, these are uh, the most uh, quite different points. Yeah. So there is a lot of numerical evidence for that. Yeah. Ah, so S equal to one, not CM case. Yeah, it's. I mean, you can always construct an integral element. Much playing away somehow all the torsion phenomenon that there is. So, okay, I wanted to tell you what this minus projection is. So, you have somehow a Frobenius uh, action on all of these uh, local components. So, I mean, uh, so partial Frobenius action on these components, and the minus projection is. You want to project onto the minus part for each of these Frobenius actions. So you do the product uh, P and S, 1 minus, well, the Frobenius times our point PS. But this is not exactly true. Um, so we have to introduce this constant AP. So this is just plus 1 or minus one and plus one in the case of split multiplicative reduction and minus one in the case of non-split multiplicative reduction. But you should, should think about this in, like in the case of S equal to one uh, and split multiplicative reduction, we have our Hegner point, our classical Hegner point, and this is just the projection to the anticyclotomic part, so the part that is not defined over F but really defined over E, only generally defined over E. Okay, so I mean, we have these kinds of conjectures, and then you can apply the minus projector to the point and get conjectures for this uh, minus projection of the point, and they actually check. Um, these conjectures for the minus part. Um, okay, so there's some numerical evidence. And there's also some theoretical evidence, and that's the last part of my talk, uh, namely the points in this polyquadratic situation. And as Alice said, you can't produce algebraic points from, from thin air. So of course, what we're trying to do is some kind of sanity check. 
So in case we know that the model well group is somehow of higher rank but generated by Higner points, um, we want to re relate somehow the de determinant of the wedge of Higner points to, to the flectic sac Higner point. So that's the last part of evidence is the polyquadratic case, or let's uh, say the polyquadratic CM case. So, um, our field F is now actually an extension of an F naught. So, polyquadratic extension of totally real fields. And polyquadratic here means that it's Galois and the Galois group. F over F naught is isomorphic to Z or to Z to the power sum S. Okay. And actually our there should be an A naught over F naught, an elliptic curve which is modular such that um, A is just uh, the base change of A naught to F. And most importantly, there should be an E naught over F naught, CM quadratic, such that E is E naught times F. So we, we are in a very degenerate situation. And Maybe to have all of these conditions on one side. So what about our set S? So our set S will consist of all primes lying above uh, a single prime We call P naught of F naught such that uh, P naught is uh, completely split and F. Do I want to assume? Ah, uh, second assumption is that. Uh, uh, P0 is of degree 1. So if I complete F0 at P0, uh, you just get QP. And you will later see why this is an important assumption. So we have all kinds of this assumptions plus some Higner, plus some Higner hypothesis. Plus some hypothesis on the ramification of primes in uh, F over F naught. We at least want one prime ramified. And I mean, there are some kind of assumptions that are not that important. So we all want all these kinds of assumptions plus the one from before. So especially since A had split multiplicative, or had multiplicative reduction at all these primes in S, this A naught will have multiplicative reduction at P naught. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, you can actually prove something. Um,
So in this case, um, by this Hegner hypothesis, you expect the rank of A naught eta of E to be greater than equal than 1. So expect uh, for all eta from the Galois group of F over F naught to plus minus 1. So you consider you have this A naught, sorry, over, over F naught. You can look at twists of this elliptic curve by um, all these quadratic characters, look at the E naught value points, and you expect via the Bergson and Dye conjecture that you always have rank at least 1. Beca because via the Hegner hypothesis, you see that uh, the complex L function vanishes at the central critical point. So you also expect then uh, that the rank of A over E is greater or equal than, well, this degree of F over F naught. But because our prime is completely split, this is the same as the size of S, which is our, our R. So we, we are in a situation where we expect that the rank is greater or equal than R. And then by our conjecture, we expect our point to be actually in the image of the determinant. OK. And then we have this theorem. Uh, that under all of these assumptions, um, the first of all, if the minus projection of our point is non-zero, then actually the rank of A over E is equal to R. And secondly, we, we want to say that our point, or this minus projection, lives inside the image of the determinant map, but it's, I mean, it's almost true. So uh, there exists a field extension, um, omega over Q quadratic, uh, in which P splits, or small p splits, such that uh, our point PS is in the image of this determinant map, if we take the exterior, the exterior power of AE, but we tensor with this omega and not only with Q. And go inside this tensor product, P and S, AEP, Q. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's almost a conjecture up to uh, some of this quadratic extension. And so, yeah, it's enough time to say something about the proof. But before that, you will see that in the proof, at some point, a square root of some rational number shows up. Um, but actually, maybe this square root is rational. We don't know. So I mean, uh, it was already uh, quite a computation to show that it's uh, it's rational, uh, that its square is rational, but it's some kind of explicit number. I mean, some kind of special values of Dedekin theta functions, some kind of Peterson norms of uh, um, forms on definite quaternion algebras and so on and so show up. So it's an explicit constant. It's, it's square. And so the question is, is this a square? I mean, it's, it should be answerable in examples by, by computation, but we haven't done this. so. Shame on us. Um, OK, so let's just say a few words about um, how to prove this. OK. Now I can erase the conjecture, I guess. Yeah. Did I mess this up? Yeah, I did, this, I did mess this up, right, Michele? I'm worried to say anything now. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 true, true, true. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's this way, right? Yeah, it's like. Yeah, this looks good now. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. The right time to erase this board. <laughs> I wrote it down correctly here, at least, at least. Okay, so somehow a sketch of the proof, very short sketch because uh, we have to be out of of here in 10 minutes, I heard. Um, OK, so I prepared a long and a short version of the proof. Let's just see. So at first, so the main ingredient uh, is a periodic Gossage formula. So that somehow relates this minus projection of uh, our point to some um, R derivative of some periodic L function. So this is some kind of periodic L function, periodic anticyclotomic uh, L function. And I will be more precise what this relation means. I first go somehow tell you the main steps and then explain this one in more detail. Is this situation, yeah, yeah. So all the uh, uh, lower, uh, smaller, I mean, lower um, uh, derivatives are zero. Yeah. I mean, it's, but it's somehow already not trivial to show that uh, the first r minus one derivatives are non-zero. It's similar to what Mahesh talked about. Yeah. It's somehow easy to see by the interpolation property or by the construction that somehow this thing vanishes at s equal to zero, but somehow higher derivatives, you have to do something. So, I mean, there's not an s. Um, okay. So that's the first step. And then the second step is that so actually this, this periodic anticyclotomic L function uh, interpolates square roots of special values of uh, anticyclotomic uh, of the complex L function. So what you really get is that you have this A over E. 
and you have to take it square. This has really an interpolation property. So this has, has interpolation property. And then this guy will live on some kind of uh, maximal abelian anticyclotomic uh, Galois group of E. And you can somehow restrict this to uh, anticyclotomic extensions of this E naught. And then you will get, where this interpolation property, um, this will factor as a product of periodic L functions now for the single prime P naught of A naught over E naught and all this twists and again squares. So this is just art informalism more or less, but the problem is that this interpolation property, I mean it's, um, it doesn't only involve like this complex L function, but also like some adjoint L values and a lot of additional numbers. So you really have to work to show that here you get a constant that is rational. Okay, but then, okay, but then you put everything together. So the R's derivative of, or the two R's derivative in this case is somehow related to the square of the, of uh, this minus projection. And then uh, you can apply the same formula here on this side as well. So this uh, D, uh, ds of this L P naught A naught over E naught. This is also related to this minus projection of now a plectic star Hickner point uh, for this prime P naught. But here we have just a single prime, right? So there you can apply Bertolini Damont and Mach. This is just uh, the minus projection of the usual Hickner point. And what you get, okay. What? No, somehow on this side, you have a periodic, you have only uh, this P naught. So we restricted somehow, and here R is, R is whatever. And we get here this product of periodic L functions, but here this Galois group is of size R. So, here you get a derivative, uh, the first derivative always. And you can, by the same periodic Grosaghe formula, you can relate this to now a classical Hegner point. And then you can show that once you have this formula, you can relate uh, the wedge of these, all of these Hegner points to the plectic stack Hegner point. Um, I have five minutes left to maybe say a few words on what I mean with this tilde there, what's the exact relation. And it's pretty similar to what Mahesh talked about. Uh, so let me just erase this. So this periodic L function, Ls A over E, actually is an element, some kind of Ibazawa algebra of Galois group, Gs, where Gs, something like uh, maximal abelian anticyclotomic extension of uh, E, unramified outside S. And then by class field theory, this is essentially um, 
you have a EP1, uh, the multiplicative group, and you take the part where Slovenia is x by minus 1, and you have a direct sum of all of these things. Here Uh, and this uh, maps via class field to, to GS, and this is essentially an isomorphism. I mean, if I tender with Q, this will be an isomorphism. And here is really where I use the uh, condition that E over F is CM. So this Grosser-G formula doesn't assume that E over F is CM. But for example, if E over F is totally real, then the Leopold conjecture would tell us that this GS here is actually just a finite group. So you don't have a lot of information there. Especially this map won't be an isomorphism. So you lose a lot of information if E is not CM. Um, so E over F is CM. But then, so, um, this now gives us a map from, uh, so let's just call this EP minus, the minus part. You can take the tensor product over all this EPR minus, minuses. Um, again, this complete the tensor product. Um, to the R's power of the augmentation idea. So I is the kernel of the augmentation map by sending, well, you have some points x1 up to xr. We send it to the reciprocity map uh, pi xi minus 1, and then the product of these kind of things. OK. So and somehow the first claim is that our element ls of a is already an element in here. So this uh, I already proved in an old uh, article with uh, Felix Bergunde. And so the second claim is one can somehow describe uh, the image of this element modulo i to the r plus 1. OK. But we want to relate this to now this e p1, this tensor product of EPRs. Here we have the minus projection. It's an element in here. But I assume that all these primes are split multiplicative reductions, so we have this state uniformization maps going on here. So this is like the tensor product of state uniformization maps. And that we take the, sorry, minus projection here, really says that we can, this comes from a point Q in this minus part here. And so this relation over here, or oh, I'm already over time, uh, just says that uh, somehow the image of Q under this map, let's just call this the derivative of the reciprocity map. So this dirac of Q is equal to this Ls of A E modulo R plus 1. So that's like the precise statement what, what this relation means. Okay, and sorry for going two minutes over time. Thank you. Thank you.